Grace, mercy, and peace to you be from God our Father and our Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. Amen. There is nothing that gets my heart pounding, my blood rushing, adrenaline just pumping in my head, quite like driving on the highway and passing a police car that pulls out and starts following me. It terrifies me. <laughs> And I don't know why. It's not like I've done anything wrong. I, I don't know if you guys did a background check on me before I came, uh, but I'm clear. I'm clean. I haven't had any negative encounters with police officers. It just terrifies me. I start freaking out thinking, okay, what have I done wrong? I usually first check the speedometer. and I'm usually in the five mile window. I'm usually only going about five <laughs> miles over. And then I think, okay, did I somehow breeze through a stop sign or stoplight or something like that that I missed? Or did I change lanes and forget to signal? Do I have a light out? Why is he following me? And yet Chris Grimm was at our service earlier. He, he was a police officer, and I, I told him, do we have any other old police officers in here, ex-police officers? Okay. I told him, I don't think you guys have it out for me. I, I really don't. Uh, when a police officer is doing their vocation, their job properly, they're trying to protect you. And they're not only trying to protect you, they're trying to protect others as well. They're trying to keep you safe. Before I came here in the month of June, Emmy and I, Adelina and Emmy's entire family, attended a wedding in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. We started from Columbus, Indiana. We rented a 12-passenger van and spent all day driving to Minneapolis. And around the town of Wisconsin Dells, which is kind of southern Wisconsin, we switched drivers. My in-laws, my mother and father-in-law, were driving all day, and it was my turn because I wanted to do the evening and night shift. I love that. We only had about four hours to go, and as I sat in the driver's seat, the first thing I did was turn the lights off. They like to keep lights on the auto function. The computer runs the lights. I don't like that. I, I, I'm weird and quirky like that. I admit it. I turn those lights off. And I drove with those lights off for a little bit because I love deciding when it's dark enough for my lights to be on. <laughs> and I did that. I turned them on at some point, but Adelina started crying about an hour into this drive. And Emmy couldn't calm her down. Oma, or Mimi and Opa, that's her grandparents, they couldn't calm her down. Aunts and uncles couldn't do it. She needed her dad. And so... I asked my mother-in-law, could you just drive for 30 minutes because I want to keep going. I'll calm her down while I'm in the back uh, with her. She said, yeah, sure, that's fine. So we pulled over to a rest area. I turned the lights off, got in the back, calmed Addie down. Well, my mother-in-law was driving for about 20, 30 minutes, and Addie was asleep. It was her, Emmy in the front passenger seat, and myself in the front middle. We were awake. And I noticed the lights are looking a little dim in the front. The, the lights in the front of the car, like, there were lights there, but they looked a little dark. And I wondered, well, maybe, maybe it's just my eyes or something. But then we really saw lights. We saw red and blue lights flashing from behind us. And I start freaking out. I'm not even driving, but I'm... If you have a car seat, you'll know modern car seats are like supercomputers. <laughs> they have to be latched certain ways. So the first thing in my mind is this guy can somehow see in the dark, and I have improperly <laughs> installed Adelina's car seat into our car. So I'm checking, trying to make sure I don't wake her up, and he comes to the window, and he starts small talking, and he says, well, do you know why I pulled you over? And my mother-in-law was like, no, I, I really don't. I'm sorry. And he was a real friendly guy. And he smiles and said, well, you're driving without your lights on. And my mother-in-law turns around <laughs> with love in her eyes. And she says, did you turn the auto lights off? And I looked at her with shame and said, yes, I did. I turned those lights off. And I did not turn them back on. 
And all the while, while I'm confessing my guilt to my mother-in-law, the police officer is laughing beside us saying, don't worry, believe it or not, you're not the first people I've pulled over tonight who are in a rental car who didn't have their lights on. And I got to admit that kind of comforted me, but it also scared me thinking there are other people out there driving without their lights <laughs> on at night. Police officers are only looking out for you because... We, in the driver's seat, we, we have our certain perspective from the driver's seat. We can see what's in front of us, usually what's out our windows. Uh, sometimes, if our rearview mirrors are adjusted properly, we can even see all around us. But our view is still limited. You see, this police officer had to step in and give us an outside perspective and tell us, your lights aren't actually on. Those are simply daylights on. You need to put your lights on. It's not only for your own safety, it's for everyone's safety. This is good that you follow the law. He, he only gave us a warning, by the way. We didn't get a ticket. We, we were good. He was a friendly guy. This image of a police officer who has an outside perspective, can kind of see the whole car, is the image I want to use as we dive in to Daniel chapter 5. Because Daniel... Being the prophet of God brings the word of God as an outside perspective to King Belshazzar, saying, you are driving with your lights off, you've got a narrow view from in your car, let me paint for you a whole picture. Daniel chapter 5, as Pastor Neil mentioned and as Owen read for us, is a really interesting chapter because it stands by itself as its own narrative with a new king, King Belshazzar. But if you heard, Daniel closely relates Belshazzar's experience to what we heard last week in Daniel chapter 4, with King Nebuchadnezzar in his pride and arrogance being humbled to eat grass like a cow. Here you have two kings acting pridefully and arrogantly, acting like sinners. But these two kings have very different responses. You see, today's story begins with Belshazzar throwing a feast, a party for thousands of lords. And in verse 1, you can already see what kind of a selfish, arrogant guy this is. Because while his people are eating, our scripture is very clear to say that he, and only he, drank wine in front of all of his guests. He's the king after all. He deserves the best. And if that wasn't enough, sometime later, he commands his servants to go get the gold, the silver, all of the plunder from God Most High's temple, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to get all of the gold and silver cups, plates, and vessels from the temple, and they're going to party with him. Now, it's really interesting, when you read Daniel chapter 4 into 5, the way Nebuchadnezzar ends Daniel chapter 4 is this great confession of faith that God Most High is the true God, the only God, and that he put King Nebuchadnezzar in power. And you're kind of led to believe that his son Belshazzar might have learned something from his father. And you're kind of thinking, oh, he's going to use God's vessels, but he's going to praise God. But that's not what happens. Belshazzar doesn't acknowledge God at all. Instead, he praises the gods, the false gods of gold, silver, iron, bronze, wood, etc. And as soon as he does that, a ghostly, supernatural hand starts writing on the wall. I don't know if any of us have seen a hand writing on the wall, <laughs> but it would creep you out. Be honest. It'd be freaky, especially because this is at night. It is against candlelight. I think Belshazzar's reaction is perfectly valid. He is terrified. His limbs go numb. He kind of just falls down because he's so scared. His knees are knocking together. He's trembling. And in his fear, in his panic, he calls the wise men of Babylon, the magicians, the en enchanters, the priests, and says, hey, tell me what's going on here. 
And you know what? In his scaredness, in his hurry to get an answer, he says, I will make you third in command of the entire Babylonian empire. I will give you all the gold jewelry you want. I'll give you all the fine clothing you want. Just tell me what's going on. And I believe that these wise men were just as scared as Belshazzar because they couldn't even come up with a fake answer. You'd think with all those gifts on the line, someone would say something, but they don't. They too are so scared by this vision from the one true God. And so the queen, being wise women, (laughs) the wise woman she is, comes to King Belshazzar and says, hey, remember your father Nebuchadnezzar used an exile, Judah, from the land that you're using these temple vessels from. Daniel's his name. He used to interpret a lot of stuff for him. Why don't don't you give Daniel a call? And Belshazzar does just that. And as Daniel comes to the throne room, Belshazzar explains for him all that he explained to the wise men. I'll make you third in command. I will give you uh, all the fine jewelry you want, all the clothes you want. Just tell me what's going on. And so Daniel looks at the king and says, I don't want any of your gifts, but I've got a word from God. I'm going to tell you what's going on. And so as Daniel begins to speak, he doesn't start with Belshazzar. He retells the story of Daniel chapter 4. He says, remember Belshazzar, your dad had that spout with God most high, the one true God. He acted like a cow because he was so arrogant. He was so prideful and God humbled him. You remember that? You remember how your father also at the end of all that said, God, I was wrong. You are right. You put me in place. You are the reason I am king. You remember all that? Well, you're sure not acting like you remember it. Daniel confronts Belshazzar and says, you should have learned the lesson from your father, but you didn't. The lesson went in one ear and out the other. And now God, after giving you these chances, giving you these warnings, has sent you this sign. And here's what it means. Mene, mene means that your days are numbered. Not only your days, but the days of your kingdom. Tekel, the next word means that you have been found in want. The scales have been weighed and you have been found wanting. In other words, King Belshazzar has been found guilty against God Most High. He's been found a sinner. And the third word, parcel, or perez, means not only is your kingdom come to an end, the Persian kingdom, another kingdom, a foreign power, is going to come in and take over. And they're going to be better than you. What does Belshazzar do with this? Goes one in, in one ear and out the other. He ignores it. I'm led to believe he goes on partying. He closed, despite Daniel's, uh, what Daniel wants, he closed Daniel with the fine gold and jewelry anyway. And Belshazzar goes on partying. In the last two verses of Daniel 5, I didn't include them, but in the last two verses of Daniel 5, we're told that Belshazzar that very night dies. He dies from his sin, from his disobedience. And in the very last verse of Daniel chapter 5, we're told that with Belshazzar's death, the Babylonian empire falls, and the kingdom of Persia led by Cyrus takes over. And the people of Israel, because Cyrus of Persia is now in power, get to go home as free people, back to Jerusalem, no longer in exile. You see, you have two kings, two kings who are dealing pridefully and arrogantly with themselves and the worlds around them. You have two sinful kings who don't want to follow God and his will, but they want to do their own thing. And the reality is, you are like these two kings. You are all sinners. We are all sinners. We are all guilty of not following God most high. We are all guilty of doing whatever we want. We are guilty of thinking that the world revolves around us and no one else. That's the reality of this sinful life. 
And as you think about that, you can take it at the most simplest way possible. Have you followed God's will for you in your life, as Jesus says, by loving God and loving your neighbor? That's a pretty broad term, so let's kind of offer a different perspective. Let's be a police officer. Let's give you a new perspective. Have you followed the Ten Commandments? Have you fear, loved, and trusted in God above all things? Or are you looking to someone else? Have you murdered anybody lately? Have you stolen anything lately? And there's probably, well, I don't want to say probably, I'm almost 99.99% sure none of you have murdered anyone here. <laughs> so let's keep narrowing the perspective. And that's where our gospel reading comes in. You see, Jesus takes a magnifying glass on each and every one of us. Because the Pharisees are acting like us. The Pharisees say, on the outside, God, I seem pretty okay. Jesus, you say I'm a sinner, but I haven't eaten any unclean food. I'm clean on the outside. I'm good. I've kept God's law. And Jesus says, you're dead wrong. And you are dead wrong because I don't only look on the outside, I also look on the inside. And it's your heart that I'm looking at. And it's from your heart that flows every evil desire. As Jesus said 10 chapters earlier in Matthew chapter 5, oh, you think you haven't committed adultery with anybody. You've heard that said. But Jesus says, I tell you the truth, if you even look at someone with lustful intent, you've committed adultery with them in your heart. You've heard it said, do not murder. But if you've even thought about someone with hateful anger, you've murdered them in your heart heart parse out the ten commandments if you've even thought about someone or something in a negative way thought about taking something that's not yours you may not have acted on it but you have thought about it jesus says that's a sin because that shows how evil your heart is in fact, why don't you read with me Jesus' summary of this in Matthew 15, how it's our heart. The heart is the problem. Read with me Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19 on page 6 in your bulletin. Let's read. But, but what, what comes, comes out, out of, of the mouth, mouth proceeds, proceeds from, from the heart, heart and, and this defiles a person. person. For out, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, thoughts murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. You may not be acting all that sinful on the outside or think you are. The reality is you are. Jesus says your heart, your heart is just as evil as it's ever been. And that's really hard to hear. That's hard to hear as an American because I can remember growing up watching Disney movies that say, follow your heart. Your heart tells you who you truly are. Your heart reveals your true identity. But Jesus says, no, your heart is deceiving you. Your heart is telling you not to do what God wants. Your heart is telling you not who you are. Your heart is quite literally killing you. For as St. Paul says, the wages of sin, the consequences of your sinful actions, the result of your sinful heart that is deceiving you is death. It's eternal separation from God. It is eternal separation from the kingdom of God, the kingdom of eternal life, the kingdom of paradise. Your heart is leads you astray. You need to hear you're a sinner. As hard as it is to hear it, you need to hear your heart is leading you astray. You need to hear that because the same Jesus who tells you your heart is messed up, your heart is leading you to sinful thoughts and deeds and actions, is the exact same Jesus who hung on a cross for you, who died for those very sins he convicts you of. 
Jesus Christ died for all of those evil thoughts, murderous, adulterous, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and gossiping thoughts that you have. Jesus died for you. And that's what distinguishes Belshazzar's response from Nebuchadnezzar's response. You see, Daniel tries to remind Belshazzar, here is a sign from God. Here is a convicting word of God. But remember what your father did. Your father, after he came to acting like a cow, he looked up to heaven and said, God, I was wrong. I was wrong. You really are most high God. I am here because of you. And the message for you today is the same word that Daniel said that every single Christian has confessed since Jesus spoke the words in our gospel. You are a sinner, but all you have to do is admit you're wrong. Admit you've sinned against God. Admit your ways are not his ways. And that is a huge act of faith. It is a huge act of faith to go before the God in heaven, to kneel down as we sing in our song. We fight by kneeling down with hands lifted high, humbling ourselves, saying, God, I am a sinner. I have messed up. I have done wrong. I haven't followed what you want. Please have mercy. That's all you can do. But that's the best thing you can do. That is the best thing you can do because our Father in heaven who loves you so much that he sent his one and only son Jesus to die for you says, you're spot on. You are a sinner. Your heart is crooked. It has led you astray. But you are also right that I am a God of mercy. I am a God who loves you. I am a God so full of grace, so full of mercy, abounding in steadfast love that I forgive you. The God of all creation, when you admit your wrong, by faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit, come before God and say, God, I've messed up, looks at you with love, with nail-pierced hands, arms out wide, Embracing you, saying, it's okay. I forgive you. I don't see your sin. I don't see those mistakes you have made time and time again. I haven't seen those really big secret things you're trying to hide. Because you have admitted by faith that you are wrong, you're good. You are forgiven. And that's where this third word, this parcel word, becomes good news for us. Because we have access to a kingdom. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus from heaven that he brings, the kingdom that the cross shows us, the cross that shows heaven and earth are being back together, they being restored back together. That kingdom is the kingdom that invades your hearts when you go before God and admit, I'm wrong. It's the kingdom that invades your hearts and says, you are forgiven. You are a new creation. You will live forever. You are welcomed into paradise. That kingdom The kingdom that was introduced to you when you admitted you were wrong, when you were washed with water and word, as you come before God and eat his body and blood, when you eat and drink, when you wash in that kingdom, that kingdom invades your defiled heart, makes it new by saying, you are forgiven. You get to live forever. In a paradise where you will struggle no more, where you will not sin anymore, where you will get to see loved ones who have gone before you again. That's why you should be like King Nebuchadnezzar. Don't be like Belshazzar. Be like King Nebuchadnezzar. Let this go in one ear and out of your mouth and look up to heaven and say, God, I'm wrong. I have sinned against you. 
have mercy on me. And the God of all heaven will look at you with loving eyes, with tender care, put a white robe on you one day as he welcomes you into paradise and say, good job, my good and faithful servant. You're forgiven. You're perfect. You are my child. As we close out this sermon, I want you to go back to page four in your bulletin. One of the hardest things that I've seen as Christians is that we just fly through some of the aspects of our service, including confession and absolution. That's kind of the time where some of us, I, I admit I've done this myself, it's like, all right, it's time to get serious. We're in church now. That we're in it. But I want to take a moment and read through it. Because the reason we start off every single service with these words is so that you realize when you walk into this place, you might be burdened with sins that are burdening your conscience, that you feel guilty about, that you're like, man, I've done this again and again this week. I thought I'd be different this week, but you haven't. We start off our service with the time for you to come before God and say, God, I've messed up again. Please have mercy. And it's also the time that Pastor Neil or I come before you with the words, you are forgiven. And those words, even though they come out of our mouths, are Jesus' words. It is Jesus speaking those words to you that you are forgiven. Paradise is yours. You've been adopted into this kingdom of God that will last forever and you will live forever because you admitted you're wrong. So let's take a moment together and just do confession and absolution again. Mm. And think as we do, think about those sins that are burdening your conscience, those, those sins that you realize, I've done that again and again. My heart is messed up. I, I keep trying to do the right thing, God, but I just can't let's go before our god and let's confess our sins in the presence of god and one another just silently think of all those sins those things that you feel guilty about and as you think of those sins and you realize that you're wrong, we, we say together, just and gracious God, we come, come to, to you, you for, for forgiveness, forgiveness and, and healing. healing. Our, Our sins sadden you, hurt others, and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our inner psyches bear scars from sins. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Forgive us our sins. Bind up our wounds. And, and free us to love for the, the sake, sake of, of Jesus Christ, Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. In Colossians 2, God's word assures us that while we were dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins, because our hearts led us astray, God made us alive together with Jesus Christ, nailing that record of sins to the cross. Therefore, at the command and by the authority of of Christ, I declare to you, your sins, all of them, no matter how big or how small, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be at peace. Be at peace, knowing eternal life, paradise waits you. Tell everyone what God has done. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, don't be like Belshazzar. Be like Nebuchadnezzar. Admit you're wrong. God will forgive you. And you have eternal life waiting for you because of it. Amen. Before we move on uh, in our sermon, a service for the reception of our new members, uh, I, I wanted to quickly just advertise something. We in the Lutheran Church believe in individual confession and absolution. But it's not like what Catholics believe. We have a different understanding. 
Uh, we don't believe that you must do it to get to heaven. Um, we believe that our public confession that we did today at service, that's good. That, that is good enough. You are confessing your sins. But I want to encourage you to email Pastor Neil and I. Again, you don't have to. This, what we did today is fine. But I want to encourage you to do it. Because I did it in St. Louis, and there is something beautiful about just verbally talking to a pastor one-on-one -on -one and verbalizing your sins, saying them out loud, and hearing the words one-on-one, -on -one, you are forgiven. It is a beautiful thing. And so what I, I encourage you to do, if you feel led to, uh, email, call, text Pastor Neil and I, uh, and, and come do one. Come do an individual confession and absolution. Again, uh, you don't have to do it to get into heaven. Our public confession, uh, that you are forgiven. And you also don't have to come with a list of every single sins that you've done this week. No, you can just come. Come and whatever is burdening your conscience, hear the words you are forgiven. It can be something as simple as, I got mad at my spouse today and I'm really feeling bad about that. But to hear the words one on one, to Feel, if you're comfortable with it, the pastor laying his hand on you and saying, you're forgiven, is a sweet gift. So if you feel led to do that, I, I just want to let you know that, that that's an option. Again, it's not required. Our corporate confession that we do is just as valid. But if you feel led, know that Pastor Neil and I's doors are always open. Mm. Our service continues. Amen.